Hans Morten Thrain Esmark was a Norwegian priest and mineralogist who lived from 1801 to 1882. One fateful day in 1829, this pastor of Brevik was hunting for ducks around the rocky islands of Langesundfjord when he noticed a black mineral in a pegmatite boulder. He chipped off some of the crystals and took them back to his parish. Over the years, Esmark grew a strong friendship with Jacob Berzelius, a Swedish chemist who lived from 1779 to 1848. So Esmark excitedly sent a sample of this glimmering mineral that he found in Norway to the Swedish chemist Berzelius, who then discovered it was a new mineral. So probably the most fascinating part is that, you know, back in the day you could name something, anything you pretty much wanted. He said to his friend Berzelius, why don't you name this Berzelite after yourself, as that was a common thing to do. But Belarius, modest as he was, decided that he would much rather name the mineral Thorite after the Norse god of thunder. If you've ever wondered why we have thorium on the periodic table instead of something else, thorite has a high thorium content and these things kind of took on a similar name. So Thor gives his name to a mineral and an element due to Jacob Berzelius, who is now known in Sweden as the father of Swedish chemistry. So he's kind of a big deal. There's even a Berzelius Day where people celebrate his accomplishments every August 20th. Thrain Esmark once was on the shore in Norway and found a different mineral. This priest could have named this anything, like after Jonah and the whale or Moses parting the Red Sea, but he decided to name it Agarite after Agar, the Norse god of the sea. It was the same priest, Thrain Esmark, who discovered Freyalite. It's just sort of counterintuitive that a priest would be naming minerals after heathen gods, but this is what happened. So let me know what you guys think of that. Maybe this priest just had a fascination with the lore of his ancestors. There's also a mineral known as Odinite. I think the stone was named after the man who found it, who just happened to have Odin in his name, but nonetheless, it is still Odinite. Thuringite was named after Thuringia. The Thuringians were an ancient Germanic tribe whose kingdom was overthrown by the Franks in the 6th century. The mineral Thuringite is the hydrous aluminum iron silicate, occurring as an aggregation of minute scales having an olive green color and pearly luster. The mineral thulite was named after Thule, a fabled land of the north first described by Pythias of Massalia, a Greek explorer born in the 4th century. Thulite is a pretty pink shade, and like pretty much every other gemstone online, you can find picture after picture of the healing properties of gemstones. One might represent how to find past lives. The other might be psychic abilities, but none of these ever give sources. So what I'm talking to you guys about today is more to do with the etymology of things, such as Thorite being named after Thor. But however, if you are looking for a stone with more of a mystical connection to the thunder gods, then I would recommend looking into getting a fulgurite. For centuries, fulgurite has been called the lightning stone or the thunder stone. It is basically fossilized lightning, often tubular, and created by the instant fusion of quartz, rock, sand, etc. by lightning. Fulgurite is named after the Roman goddess Fulgora, who presides over lightning. Iolite has the nickname of Viking Compass due to the belief that this is the stone Norsemen use to help them navigate stormy weather. Although some popular elements have Germanic etymology, such as gold, silver, copper, and iron, on the periodic table that many of us struggle to learn in chemistry class, only two elements are named after Norse gods. There's the aforementioned thorium, and the other one is vanadium. Vanadium derives from Vanadis, another name of the goddess Freya, meaning the dizzer of the banner. One other heathenish element, perhaps worth mentioning, is kobold, named after the Germanic kobold, a mischievous goblin of the mines. When German miners found this pesky ore that resembled silver, but wasn't, and its fumes also made them sick, they thought that the goblins were perhaps stealing silver and replacing it with a fake silver to play tricks on them. 
It makes sense that when they didn't understand the cause of an illness, that they would blame it on some sort of invisible power like the kobold or otherworldly being. It was later discovered that these fumes were actually sulfur and arsenic vapors released during the smelting process that was making them sick. There are a few famous kobolds, such as Hadakin, which is low German for little hat. So this goblin gets his name due to the fact that he wears a little felt hat. King Goldemar of German folklore is known for being tangible but not visible. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the kobold Hadakin frightens unfaithful wives, and Goldemar sees the secret sins of the clergy. So I just thought that was pretty cool how kobold on the periodic table derives from the Germanic kobold, referring to a goblin or underground spirit. There seem to be different kinds of kobolds. You have these that were invisible and lived underground in the mountains. And then you had more household spirits, comparable to maybe the Norwegian Nise, that they would appease with food and offerings. The kobold was known for being very angry when he's hungry. So this goblin gets hangry. The word kobold is also cognate with Anglo-Saxon kofgadas, which means household gods. And Jacob Grimm mentions in his book Teutonic Mythology how people at one point, they used to make little effigies or idols of these goblins and keep them in the house somewhere. Christians turned a blind eye to a form of heathen worship, basically. The first thing that popped up on Google was that Kobold beliefs are evidence of the survival of pagan customs after the Roman Catholicization of Germany, or merely that legends of them have lived on. 